Welcome to another edition of Ryan's Recap. We have your big stories and your big news that we're about to give you. Let's get into Ryan's Recap. We start off with breaking news. President Obama's immigration plan has been shut down by the Supreme Court. President Obama's plan was to help millions of living in the U.S. illegally immigrants uh, to help them out and live in this country and overall be able to get jobs. And in a Supreme Court ruling, in a four to four decision, it has been killed off the whole plan. And overall, the direction of America and the immigration policies will now be determined in the next presidential election. It will be a huge decision. Trump wants to build a wall. Hillary wants to usually continue the plan. She has said that she uh, thinks that it would work to restore programs and go further. Trump has said that he will make sure that Obama's unconstitutional actions never come back. On immigration, this will likely not lead to an increase in deportations since the president also is still in power. But the ruling affects President Obama's efforts for immigrants and their rights to work legally in the U.S. Also, we have breaking news again as a, the New Orlando, Florida gun tragedy that killed 49 people. They have found that the gunman went to Pulse earlier that Saturday night before carrying out his attack against the gay club. They, law enforcement has, have been looking at cameras, looking at video, and the gunman had paid an entry fee. He got a wristband and entered the club, and investigators believe he was checking out the club and the security in it. When the gunman left his home Saturday, in Fort Pierce, his wife was pleading him not to leave because he was carrying a bag of guns and he was also uh, very angry at that point. His wife said she did not know he was planning an attack. On to the house where the gun control law has led to a sit down. The Democrats just recently ended their sit down but it was all in protest as it was used to force votes on the gun control laws, all leading back to the Orlando tragedy. The sit-in eventually drew 170 lawmakers. It lit up social media and the Republicans were infuriated, but it also did not cause any legislative action. We must come back here on July 5th when Congress will return to session, more determined than ever before, said the representative John Lewis, who ended up launching the sit-in. In other news, the Cleveland Cavaliers have won the NBA championship. It's the first time in 52 years, and the Cleveland won the game 93-89 to in Game 7 and became the first team in NBA history to overcome a 3-1 deficit. LeBron James won the MVP and led the game with 27 points, 11 rebounds, and 11 assists for a triple-double. This is the first time since 1964 Cleveland has won a championship. The Browns were the last team. Trump is also using donation money, and reports show he used $6 million in campaign money to pay his own company and family members. It's given quite the uh, reaction as reluctant donors have reasons now to withdraw money from his funds. The spending includes a $420,000 payment to a private club in Florida that serves as his vacation home and enough Trump branded water bottles to fill a bathtub. In response, Donald Trump said he largely financed his successful primary bid through personal loans and is leaning heavily on the Republican National Committee for help. And now I want to go into an event I recently went to. It's called the Amity Race. And it was a great event. It brings people together. It helps the community. 
And it's all about bringing race and community and some of the founders I spoke with. They're trying to make it a national holiday. We have a few photos of the event uh, from that day. It was uh, a beautiful day right near uh, Government Center. Uh, there was music. It brought the whole community together. You uh, basically have groups that aren't the biggest groups, but usually get the, uh, not the recognition that they should receive, but stuff that really should involve your community. I definitely recommend it. This was uh, several years now that they've had this event. And there's another event called the H2 Flow Group, which is started about seven years ago. And the whole group is based around in Florida on summer camps, skateboarding, paddle boating, surfing, paintball, hockey. And it's uh, estimated that one of the founders I spoke with, Rob Lewis, he says that there's about 700, uh, 7,500 to 9,000 kids in these camps. And he hopes to start up a similar foundation in Boston relatively soon. Now I want to go on to the opiate crisis where Charlie Baker, our governor, he made a statement recently regarding his son and his son had a concussion that he didn't reveal for a while and he was once on opiates uh, to try to help fix the concussion. It was a rather serious one and he spoke out to the public saying he feels the pain that families feel with opiate addiction because he was so scared that his son could have been addicted to opiates after his concussion. His son actually didn't, but he says that he wants to change the opiate crisis in Massachusetts. And for more on this, I had an interview with Brent Kisby. He's a Tufts researcher, and he studied drug addiction at Northeastern University. And he, we had a very interesting discussion on the opiate crisis in Massachusetts. Some of the things you will see during this interview are that it's not as much a community issue as something that has happened through the hospitals, through faulty prescriptions, through problems that have happened that they're trying to come up with stronger, stronger policies to fix this issue, but right now it's gotten fully out of hand. So let's take a look and learn more about the opiate crisis in Massachusetts. What is, what are opiates? So opiates are a broad class of, um, anal of analgesic um, pain relievers. So these groups of compounds like oxycodone, morphine, are class two scheduled, meaning that these drugs have analgesic pain reducing properties um, versus the one that a lot of uh, people in Massachusetts are taking is heroin which is another type of opiate, but it is about, it's highly addictive, and other ones such as fentanyl, which is actually coming on the streets as well, which is even more uh, addictive than morphine as well as heroin. And these opiates are plaguing Massachusetts right now. Describe the addictive effects from opiates. So these compounds, um, uh, morphine and heroin are very very closely similar structurally so as morphine gets into the brain it crosses the blood brain barrier which is the protective um, barrier to get to the brain for other drugs and only drugs that are penetrable can get in um, and heroin gets in there a lot faster and that is a uh, key thing in the field of drug addiction, so that if you have a drug that crosses this a lot faster, then you get a lot more um, addictive and effects of these drugs. So you, you want, a, so for the addict, they want a drug that is highly, cr uh, highly able to cross the blood brain barrier, and as this, because it causes the effects a lot more, faster and you want that in drug. Overall in the spectrum of drugs, opiates are probably one of the most addictive. 
Um, there are one, so in the laboratory uh, set, um, it's very, uh, psychostimulants are very, very highly addictive, and that we're able to show a clear self administration, or the, these rats are able to work for the drug. Um, it's harder for heroin um, as well as other drugs of abuse, but there have been many labs uh, across the country and the world that have used cocaine or methamphetamine as a drug, but heroin is a lot harder in the lab versus seeing it in, um, in the human population because there is a lot of psychosomatic um, aspects as well as having um, a huge cycle in human drug addiction versus um, animal drug addiction because they have as humans have a higher um, higher thought process, so that's one, the, one of the main reasons why you see um, heroin being a very common drug right now. What are your thoughts on the increase in opiates being used as a drug throughout Massachusetts? Uses? So, opiates like morphine, oxycodone, hydrocodone, and codeine are known to be a very effective um, pain reliever. It's been shown in, since the 70s and showing that it is a very good pain reliever. But they are very, very addictive. Um, and <clears throat> the new governor has uh, put forth saying that we need to limit um, prescriptions of these because these Drugs are for people that are in chronic pain, the chronic like pain that does not go away. And if you're a lot of people are getting these because they have simple ailments, and these are not specifically um, these drugs are not able to be used for them, and they should not be used for it. Um, and a lot of doctors are to blame in Massachusetts, and studies show that. Doctors are overprescribing these drugs, um, and <clears throat> there's there, the AD, uh, the American uh, Medical Association and the American Dental Association are trying to put forth more education and seminars for doctors to be able to understand prescribing practices, better prescribing practices. So briefly, opiates are not as much a street drug that people are getting through other people, rather they're getting it more through doctors and pharmacists. Um, yes, so the re real reason why this crisis started was the overprescribing of narcotics back in the 90s and in the early, uh, mid early 2000s. So we saw a surge of these narcotics um, in the 90s and early 2000s because this was this is what doctors were using. Um, <clears throat> and people um, got addicted to these drugs. And how do, you, like, how do you find cheaper drugs? You go on the street and you get heroin. And heroin is actually very cheap. Um, to my knowledge, I'm not, I do not know what the value of heroin on the streets are, but I do know that it's significantly cheaper than getting pills um, from illegal markets. Uh, what might be the future of opiate use in Massachusetts and will this get worse? Um, so I feel like it, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, as of the end of 2015 there were 13 about roughly about 1300 deaths overdose deaths in Massachusetts. That also doesn't include um, those that overdose and survived. That number is, we don't have that number, those numbers. Those are ER visits and people who are about to be, uh, who are on the brink of death, they come back um, from drugs like naloxone, naltrexone, or methadone, they survive. But recurrence is very, very high. and drug relapse, uh, which is how people get back onto the drugs, is very high. Thir so about 1,300 people, uh, 1,300, 1,500 people, give or take, died from it versus people that just overdosed and survived. And those numbers are a lot higher, which is actually hurting Massachusetts and Boston's ERs. What's the best way to treat this problem 
with opiate use and how should we go forth in fixing the problem? It's a very interesting topic in the field of drug abuse pharmacology is trying to find drugs that are of illicit pain reliever, pain relief, um, but do not elicit the addictive, addictive qualities. There are labs down at Scripps, uh, the Scripps Research Institute in Florida, um, Mount Sinai Hospital, um, individuals there who are working on great research um, on these new, uh, on possible pain relief and um, trying to elicit pain relief without the addiction qualities. And a interesting uh, lab who are really close colleagues of mine at Northeastern University here in Boston, um, where they're looking at other types of systems within the brain um, to look at pain relief, um, not via opiates, but um, the cannabinoid system. Trying to use that, use compounds that will actually elicit pain relief, but not have addictive qualities. Do you think drugs like Narcan are hurting the overall rise in um, opiates, or do you think it's something where it's saving lives and a good thing? It's a double-edged sword. Um, there are those that feel like, oh, I can overdose and I know I'll have Narcan, I can just ease that and get high again. But on the other hand, it is an extremely lifesaver drug in this field of trying to, of reversing drug uh, overdose. Um, it has been used by fellow colleagues of mine in the uh, medical uh, services, um, emergency medical services, and they, they sh tell me that is an extremely uh, great drug, that these people survive, but they do know that people are going to shoot up again. It's a very temporary, it's a band-aid. It really is just a band-aid, and people are going to shoot up again. Um, and that's what we're seeing, um, and it's, it's a sad atmosphere right now, but it's what's happening. So there has to be further, um, further things going on in uh, Massachusetts uh, government to really state, um, to really hammer down on the epidemic and not really touch upon um, <clears throat> Narcan, because Narcan really is a great compound to help overdose. What scares you the most about the increase of opiates in the New England area? What scares me the most is kids between the ages of 18 to 30 are the number one group of um, people that are taking these drugs and are dying. Our generation between these age groups are dying by the numbers. Um, recent numbers from Massachusetts are four people a day are dying of any, from an, op an opiate overdose, whether it be more uh, morphine, heroin, fentanyl. So, there's some type of opiate that they're overdosing from, and it's our it's the age group between 18 to 30, 35, and they're all they're dying, um, <clears throat> and something needs to be done. What? Do you believe, leading right into the question, has to be done to stop the fight on opiates? Um, so there's a few things. Um, has to, I feel that it should be an education uh, to doctors in the, uh, in the state of Massachusetts, um, especially in Boston where we have three great uh, hospitals and uh, several great hospitals and medical institutions, medical schools. It has to be taught there. Addiction medicine is a... Addiction medicine in Massachusetts or in addiction medicine classes in med schools aren't, aren't brought up to the breadth of what addiction really is. So an interesting study um, from a Boston, local Boston hospital um, from study from this year was showing that um, those that were uh, known to have a diagnosis of endocarditis, which is an infection of the heart, um, 
most likely it's caused, this endocarditis is usually caused by other drug use. Um, and of the population, um, one out of seven were also diagnosed with a substance use disorder, um, which, is, which was most likely IV drug use, and that's what they indicated was IV drug use. Um, but um, they showed that there was no uh, individuals between the study time frame of 2004 until 2014 that any of these individuals got any treatment for opiate uh, substance abuse, um, which is daunting and scary because these individuals did not get any treatment, showing that the stigma of drug addiction is very much there, even in the uh, doctoral clinical setting. Um, and it's really saddening to see from a scientist's point of view and as well as a clinical point of view that this situation is going to get worse before it gets better. And doctors, as well as politicians, need to realize that drug addiction, and drug addicts, and drug um, drugs are are there. So there you have it. The opiate crisis, it's continuing. He thought it was something that was going to build uh, in the upcoming years. Hopefully politicians are listening. Hopefully we can have a real change in this state and really uh, fix this whole problem. And uh, coming up on the show after the break, I'm going to have Jeanette Wezzo, and she's going to be talking about social change and justice in our community. Stay tuned. Oh, hello there. I'm Ryan Chevalier, the host and reporter of BNN TV's Ryan's Recap, news and sports show. When I have a down day, I like to sit back and watch my show, and you should too. Check out just what you can see on Ryan's Recap. In Boston, schools have been found to have high levels of lead. One of the schools that was found to have an exceeding amount of lead in its water fountains was here at Harvard University is trying to end gender discrimination in student organizations. Harvard says undergrads who join unrecognized single gendered organizations will not receive dean recommendations for scholarships. Fenway Park, the Red Sox have extended their protective netting in order to protect fans. Ryan's recap is on Comcast Channel 23 and RCN Channel 83. You won't want to miss a show, so tune in. Welcome back to Ryan's recap. I have Jeanette Wezzo on the show today, and she's a social activist. She does a lot of work for the community and works in social justice. So I have to start off with how do you get such a passion in this field? Well, before anything, thank you so much oh, no for opening this space for me. So I'm an immigrant from El Salvador. I left my country during the Civil War 27 years ago. It was for political reasons. You know, it's United States was putting in $1 million a day to, uh, to the Army to kill ourselves. So, you know, I'm an effect of a Civil War that the United States was sponsoring. So um, I was very lucky because I was able to come and study to the University of South Carolina. That's how I escaped. But I was um, working for against inequality, against injustice in El Salvador by then. It was 14 families that owned the country, basically. And um, was a strong social movement fighting for equality. I was um, working with peasants, which were the poorest of the poor. And that was not happy for the government, one you know, well-educated woman working for poor people, understand their right and fight for it. So I was arrested several times. And at some point, I was you know, pretty sure that the next it'll be me, that I'll be murdered. So it was a very tough decision to leave the country because I left four of my kids. I am a mother of nine, and four of them stay in El Salvador with my mother. 
And we have this conversation with my mom, and I was like, I just can't leave my kids. They're my life. But my mother said to me, how you, how you can give a life to them if you are in a risk to lose the life? You know, and she said, what's happening if you get killed? I'm an older person. I won't be able to raise these kids. So, um, you know, I, I, I decided, took that the hard decision, uh, but I believe it was the right one because now those four kids that I left live here in the United States legally. They enter with a big door with big papers. Now they have nice life. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was worth it. And you know some of them. Mm -hmm. um, so I politicized during Civil War. So for me, principle and values, I practice it. So when I came here, you know, after I finished my college, I came to, to Boston. And I started doing what every single immigrant does, you know, cleaning toilets, something that I never have been done in my life taking care of other kids, uh, cleaning windows, watching dogs, you name it. But I am an organizer, you know. I, I, I am against in, injustice. And at some point, someone met me, and, and she said, are you from El Salvador? And I said, yes. So you know how organized, and I said, yes, I do. So my English was not that good by then, but she gave me the first opportunity to start working around education issues mm -hmm. in the Boston Public School. I'm telling you like 20 years ago, mm -hmm. 22 years ago. And um, I was one of the organizers for the Latino Parents Association that is, doesn't exist anymore, where parents facing those hard issues around education. And uh, for me to come from one way to really organize in the front line and don't be afraid mm -hmm. um, was choking. You know, they were like, cr look me like, are you crazy? When I have this idea, let's have a huge banner in key schools in Boston that say education is a right, not a privilege. They were like freaking out. Mm. And I lose my job because that reason. I will mm. it can happen. I was like, but it's just a, you know, a message. Mm. We need parents. We need a lot of parents. It's not like one from here and the other. That's how no building a movement. We need to educate parents, and probably they don't understand, but they will be intrigued. They wanna be part of the organization. Let's do it. And then I lost my job because. One of, that was one, one of the reasons. And then I was, uh, but I, I knew, you know, that that was coming. So I was applying to another organization that is called the Coalition for Basic Human Needs. Mm -hmm. That was a welfare right group. It was a coalition with different uh, organizations, the home coalition that they were targeting people, you know, in housing, a homeless coalition and tenants' rights was a huge coalition, and I started organizing Welfare's Mom. But then Mr. Clinton administration passed the welfare reform. So then it was over. Then I moved to WILE, which is the Women's Institute for Leadership Development. Mm -hmm. um, and I was the program director where women in unions were looking for tools to become officers or you know leaders in their union you and know it's let me just bump in real quick so was there uh, a reason too that it was centered around women for the most part did you feel a need to reach out to women yeah because mm -hmm. uh, here especially in this society you can see race right in front of you but there are two issues that are not clear class and gender. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that we need to really expose those two things. Because if you see the majority are women, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 
geographically, number, but you don't see women's in power. You know what I mean? So we talk about different rules and policies and laws, but who made it? Are white male. Mm -hmm. Very few women. And women of color, it works. So I was working with this organization that, I, again, I'm, I was, I'm coming from a different perspective. And in my country, a labor movement is everyone. Every force, labor force from the, the, the country, no matter what, you are in a union or not. Here, the labor movement is only people in union. So you and me, if you are, we are not part of the, the labor union, we're not part of the labor movement. Mm -hmm. So I was like, that's wrong. First, we're women before anything. And no matter what, we are in union or not, we are part of the labor movement. So that was changing in this organization. And then I was working at SEIU um, as an organizer, but that's, I realized that the union was not for me. And then became uh, one of educator for United for a Fair Economy. Because I, I tried different issues, but I feel something was missing. Mm -hmm. Was missing was the piece that United for a Fair Economy does, which is the analysis of our economic inequality. Mm -hmm. And it, now you co-authored for uh, several of the United Fair economy state of dreams reports yes. uh, on racial economic inequality in the U.S. So what have you found on these parts that you have co-authored on the inequalities? Well, one of the striking ones was in 2008 that we were um, predicting the housing bubble. You know, a lot of our friends, you know, the economists, they were like, are you crazy? They were like, no, that's not going to happen. They, yes, it's going to happen. And we were presenting before the bubble burst. And that was a setup for communities of color. Because if we're not that way, who's losing housing more were white people. So that is something that we need to talk about. It. There are policies. There are rules that are protecting one community and I'm protecting others. And that's the work that we do through United for a Fair Economy. The other thing is last year, um, we find out that 70 million people in the United States have no access to the bank system. They can have checking account, they can have saving account. That's why they rely on the, you know, in the checking, cashing checks, where they are losing money. Why? Because there are a lot of requirements. You have to have a good credit, or you have to have direct deposit, have X amount of money in the bank, or this and that, and people can afford it. So one of the solutions that we were, uh, you know, offering was the postal banking in the past. Every postal banking has like a small bank. They have a checking and savings account, small. And if you see, there are in every uh, zip code, there are more than banks. So um, another um, uh, finding was that in 2046, people of color will be the majority mm -hmm. in this country. You know, so geographically we are uh, changing, the problem is it'll be more concentrated in the power and the money mm -hmm. if rules not ch don't change. So there are different things that we have been, uh, you know, researching with this State of the Dream report. This year, we decide that, you know, 10 years we have been bringing this report, pushing race as an important issue among the policies that is affecting the communities. So we believe it was not our role anymore after Black Lives Matter. You know, the movement is right there, and they know what they are doing. So we contacting them, and they say, what about if you can help us in doing an infographic? So that was 
the report this year, we did an infographic. I'm, I'm going to send it a couple of you. I forgot to bring it. But it's the infographic, there are different um, graphics, you know, uh, cartoons that is representing the information that we're going to pass. And in this case was how many people are is, is uh, in prison. That right now, United States one of the is the top one in the, the world having people in, in, in jail. Uh, but how many black people are there, you know? And the guns control, how many people are get killed, and how many, you know, the, the, the arms that is available for people over there, the housing, and but targeting black community. So they asked for it, and that's what we did. We, we feel it's not our, uh, you know, place anymore. So we ask for it, and that's what they need. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are thinking right now for the next State of the Dream report that we have different ideas, but we don't know yet mm -hmm. what we want to talk about. Um, this is a little side note, but a lot of people in Boston, there's a huge issue on housing and mm -hmm. how rent has gone up, and we there's a constant problem we've seen in San Francisco with people becoming homeless and kicked out of their apartments because of racial inequalities and cost problems. So have you studied um, any of that field? I was just oh yeah, the gentrification mm -hmm. is, you can see it right now, mm -hmm. all uh, here in right. Jamaica Plain. We're pushing communities, we're pushing families to out of the city, can't afford it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are another issue that there are a lot of students. We have tons of universities, and one student can pay six, 700, 800 for a room. So if they get together, two or three, they can have, have a nice house with one room, no a family. So that's one of the, the, the issues that we are facing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there are big development, but there are not affordable housing on those development. There are condos. Who going to buy a condo? Mm, right. A CEO, a politician, a sport. You know, we are full of sports here, so they can afford it. You see in downtown, who going to spend $54 million in one condo? That is, that is the price of the millennium one. Mm -hmm. Who can pay that? You know, in the meantime, Chinatown is getting destroyed. So that um, is the new face of Boston. It's full of business, full of rich people, and communities are going, you know, to Brockton, to Randolph, to those areas where there are no jobs. Mm -hmm. And there's actually one story I in particularly heard uh, in San Francisco where a woman it was making $70,000 a year in San Francisco, and she can't find housing right now. <laughs> it's just baffling. Yeah. It's amazing. But yeah. um, overall, briefly, what is the future? So you have the reports, but what's the next step to presenting these reports and then making a change? We are a um, uh, national organization, like I, I said to you. We have one of the few programs in the, in the country that is called Responsible Wealth. So we organize people in the what top percent. There are not many, but there are few that they want to be responsible. They are part of our organization, not for the money, but for their voices. For example, Bill Gates Sr. is one of our members. So he came to the Congress and he said, I'm going to pay my taxes. Don't give me a break. I can pay it. That make news and that make changes. So one of the way that we do is use those voices and use the, you know, the, the lobbies that you pay to having all the money to make those changes. So that's one way. And the other way, is use that information with other groups that are members and they can organize and they can push. So there are the big voices and the 
massive voices to say this is need to change, but need to be structural changes with the policies. For example, you were mentioning uh, at the breaking news, the immigration. Mm -hmm. Very briefly, between 1940s and 60s, the immigration laws were in labor department because the immigrants were considering workers. Then they switch to the Justice Department because, you know, when Reagan stuff, we're like, oh my God, it's the communist group and we have to be very careful. Switch it to the Justice Department because we were considering terrorists, mm -hmm. you know, no, criminals. But after the 9-11, we are part of the Homeland Security. We're considering terrorists. What's happened? We need to come back and be considering workers because that's where we are. You know? So that simple like that. Right. Right there is the solution. But there are not the willing mm -hmm. to do it. Well, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with Jeanette Huzo. And stay tuned. They say that when you're facing extreme danger, your life flashes before you. If you think that's sad, consider facing it before you even have enough life to flash before your eyes. Car crashes are a leading killer of children 1 to 13. Deaths and injuries can be prevented by using the right car seat. Visit safercar.gov slash the right seat to know what is appropriate for each age and size. Everywhere that we go, he makes people laugh, makes people smile, and I feel like I have that quality. He's the one who always takes me fishing. I watch golf with him. And <laughs> I watch him cook, because when I grow up, I want to be a cook, too. I mean, you have the same faces like this. Dad is the one, when you fall, that picks you up. That unconditional sense of presence and um, reassurance is really what makes him my father. Welcome back to Ryan's Recap. And you mentioned immigration a little bit, and I want to get into that because you've also helped immigrants. And is it partially also because you were an immigrant worker yourself that you felt connected and obligated to help these people? There are several things that are not in the debate, which is the root cause of immigration. You know, there are immigration around the world. But the debate is Mexico down. Why? We don't talk about it. But what is the role of United States foreign policies as well? You know, you have Colombia, for example. How many military bases there are? Instead to put that money in military spending, put it in social program. I will never, never, will like to come to the United States. I was fine in my country. I love my country. I miss my country. But there are no you know, ways. In my case, I have to save my life because I was fighting for the right. But where other people that they, don't, they didn't have no hope, no opportunities, nothing. By then, even the agriculture, we were, we were agriculture people. We're, Done, we're over, we're killed through trace agreements. CAFTA came, you know, it's, it's, it's not affordable anymore to grow corn because United States send them cheaper. But here there are subsidies. The agriculture are subsidized, not over there. So those little things can change it, you know. CAFTA in Central America killed the economies. But the other thing is, 
uh, South America and Central America has natural resources that the United States doesn't have. So there are those things underneath, you know, this um, so-called crisis that the kids are coming, the kids are not coming by themselves. The kids are coming with somebody else. And they come to reunite their parents. Mm -hmm. And that has been all the time. It's now that they are making big deal, but it is, you know. This country is talking about family values. Family values for whom? Because right there, they're separate families. You know, the, the DACA DAPA, that was, it'll be happen. Reunite families, now it's continuing, you know. Um, that the thing is like, there are root causes of that. Yes, I came here because I was pushed. But also, there are these push and pull factor. You know, there are one economist that say, if in a country there are a million people undocumented, it's a problem. But when you have 11 million people undocumented, it's a big business. It's cheaper. You have people undocumented with no paper, you can abuse them, no benefit, they can work like animals, and there are more profit, you know, for that. So that's the reality. The, it's, it's a complicated issue, but we need to see it. What is the foreign policy has to do? What is the militaris, militarization issue has to do? Uh, you know, the, there are these drug um, issues that that's the problem, you know, that is making people come. Yeah, but from where it's coming? You know, who's, who's behind? Who's the interest? Who's the winner? Who's the loser? All of those things, we need to really think about it. You have a huge debate <laughs> right now going on uh, in the presidential nomination of gun control, immigration. Uh, I've heard uh, about how there are people who come over from Mexico and they are caught and then a week later, uh, they'll try it again. It's 60% around that number will try it again once they're captured. So with that said, I figure you're not uh, in favor of rulings like Donald Trump, but what's your opinion on the whole immigration, bringing people in the country, and then also you have the terrorists and the, the uh, shootings happening and this huge debate going on. Again, we need to see that the, you, the immigration is not from Mexico down. It's around the world. Mm -hmm. And people that are getting the shooting are not from Mexico down. That's what they are getting killed. Uh, for example, in Orlando shooting. You know, that's, uh, I feel the media was, um, not, the, not doing the right thing, was very irresponsible to put it in right there. This is, you know, a terrorist. That wasn't, that was a hate, a hate crime, simple like that. But it's fueling for people that you can see all the time in the news. You know, this will be a mess. It, it will be continuing being a mess. As an organization, we are not partisan, so we are not talking about any political parties but what we see is the behave of hate that is, you know, promoting against pitting each other, pitting against uh, communities. And there are one data that there are a lot of Mexicans that are returning to Mexico. They are leaving the United States. And it's a real number. The, at this point, there are less people that are coming in undocumented, that are passing the border undocumented. There are less people than before. And our president, our actual president, has the, you know, the, the winning numbers of deporting families. And he's not deporting criminals, he's deporting workers, mothers, kids, you know? So um, it is a very complicated topic that we will need an hour to talk. And I can have data for you uh, that, you know, that I that can, can support what I'm saying, that people are leaving the United States, are not coming back. 
Well, I'd numbers. love to have you on a future show yeah. too. <laughs> but also, what would you like to see for the future in not even immigration, but overall, all the reports, research you've done, what would you like to see for fixing inequalities for our future? I believe until the, in the political arena, there are not people from the base, from the community, from the communities affected, that's not gonna change. You know, the, if the politicians are rich people, that are, what they are doing is like continuing the status quo, keeping their means, not gonna be changes. Need repre real representation, then gonna be the changes. And I think there are plenty of people out there that can do a decent job representing communities and listening to communities and, you know, voicing communities. But right now, they're not representation. So until that doesn't happen, we will continue in complaining. We need to build power in the community. Yes. Uh, one of the things from your website was to help find people, uh, help immigrant workers, people who are of lower inequality, find their voice. And that's a major issue we just talked about and something that is going on in Boston and all over the world that yeah. you see every day. <laughs> that's right. Are there any final thoughts that you would just like to add briefly before we close? Yeah, I just would love to um, people go and visit our website, which is mm -hmm. www.fareconomy.org. Like us in Facebook and following us in Twitter. We, have, we are bilingual um, information. We are committed with uh, language justice, which everything that we do is bilingual in English and Spanish for now. We're planning to extend it, but for now, that's what we have. And I just want to thank you again for yeah. opening this space for me and my organization that I guess, I feel we have a lot of to share. Mm -hmm. And we don't have those spaces. It's been thank a you. pleasure. Thank, thank you very you. much. For more information, you can also call 617-423-2148. The information was shown throughout the show. And I'm your host, Ryan Chevalier. I want to thank my guests. I want to thank my crew. And thank you for tuning in to Ryan's Recap. Until next time. <laughs>